Let me see. We'll kind of pick up where we left off last week, and we'll probably go back. I think Dale wanted to... <laughs> it, again, I'll take responsibility for the time management. We didn't allocate enough time for time management. <laughs> so we'll go back. We'll cover some of that and uh, go over uh, some of the stewardship, uh, how to uh, delegate, things like that. And then we'll get into habit four today. Uh, and then, we'll, then next Wednesday, we'll finish up with uh, five, six, and seven. So um, kind of give you guys an uh, overview of kind of where we're heading today. Um, next week, I'll be participating with you guys from distance learning students. Um, I have to give, a, actually, I'm making a presentation with um, two other old professionals who lecture for us here and two YPs that have had the courses, got their certificate. So uh, we're dealing that with the Utility Management Conference. It's an AWWF conference, and it was the only time that they uh, let me go on stage. So that will be Eastern time, be 3.30 till about 5, and I'll be taking care of that. But uh, obviously by 3 o'clock our time, I'll be back, and we can, uh, Dale will be here to finish things up, and then I'll keep my eye on you guys. Make sure you're, uh, uh, which is not going to be a problem. Get some stuff done. I always have comments anyway, so I have to be a spot where I can uh, order in some comments for you guys. So keep in mind, yeah, I won't be here. Doesn't mean I don't love you, but I have another, another opportunity here to promote CU and the program. So, so we'll be doing that. I'll let you know. Uh, uh, ta ta ta. Homework comments. Uh, only. Uh, nearly, uh, uh, oh my God, 15 or 16 people in class. Only happy to turn in your questions for this week. Don't forget to turn in your questions, guys. It has an impact on your grade, so make sure you get that done. Uh, we can look at the syllabus or the lesson plan. It'll be very specific about what your readings are, and I want you to turn in some questions. And again, it's the questions are a big help for day online and all the lectures. So, so make sure you get those into me. Homework number two is out there. I thank you guys. Um, it's already uploaded, uh, homework number two, and it talks a little bit about looking back on your career and your life, how seven habits might have had a big impact on you. So I think that and we want to get that turned in a little bit. Uh, because by that time, you've read the whole stuff and had a few lectures on it. And, uh, and if you turn it in before class next time, then Dale and I, again, can see how that. Um, see if you have any have any questions uh, for that. Uh, let's see. What else was I going to talk about? Questions. What I'll do, I, I wanted to, at the beginning of the class, I wanted to go back, and there were some of the questions, uh, great questions that you guys had turned in. Um, uh, homework question number one. Uh, we touched on some of them yesterday, but basically there are three or four of them that I want to go back and and we'll do it real quick before we get started in class today. Um, all the, you had a lot of questions about level five, and we're going to answer all those questions next week because that was my bad. I should have put the reading on level five columns <coughs> next week, but again, I did it too soon. So same questions, same comments, so we'll go over that next week. I want you to think about uh, not doing anything before you on that. And the questions today, you had a lot of great questions. Um, I think um, uh, basically a lot of it has to do with win win, and that's what, they, what basically I think what uh, they was going to be talking about today. And if you reflect back what we talked about last week, we were talking about a uh, beginning for the seven habits, and um, uh, basically um, there were three habits that we got into, but basically talking about uh, the seven habits. And I talked at the very class, I talked about some of the differences between management and leadership, and just wanted to make sure there was in the seven habits book on habit number two, uh, Covey on page 101, he talks about leadership and management. Uh, the two creations, he called them. They, you guys may not remember this, but reflecting back on this, I wanted to make sure we cover this again. It says, habit two is based on principles of personal leadership which means that leadership is the, is the first creation. Leadership is not management. Management is the second creation, which we'll discuss in, in habit number three. 
Uh, management is the bottom line for uh, the line focus. How can I do the best to accomplish certain things? Um, management, again, he gets back to managers doing things right, leadership doing the right thing. So, again, that's Covey's, um, uh, his definition. I wanted to revisit that to kind of give you guys a heads up for that to let you know there is a difference between those uh, those two components. And, um, and, and again, the last point is that really what we're doing is laying you guys a foundation of you know, not preaching you guys and telling you this is the best way to be a leader, things like that, but we're giving you the, the important building blocks of the foundation uh, to be a, to kind of be a leader. And, and from time to time, I always struggle a little bit. I wonder if graduate students are thinking, now ah, these old guys are up there talking about seven habits and stuff like that. But everyone, obviously, from time to time, I get emails back from my graduate students. And uh, just before class, I'm kind of like a mentor for uh, Engineers Without Borders. And, uh, Austin, who's, uh, or Madison, who heads that up this year, he's a sophomore, junior. Maybe he came into my office, had some questions. And she saw Seven Habits on my desk, and she said, that's a great book. I've read that book, and it's worked very well for me. And she says, the best important part of that you talk about time management, it's a big benefit for her. So, again, I told her, thanks a lot, Madison. I can't give you a good grade, but that's a good. So I wanted to pass this on to you guys. That there are a lot of other people, young professionals, who get some direction from another professor who remind her, why don't you take a look and read the Seven Habits book. And, uh, again, for me to get good feedback like that, that's a big help for me because it's going to give me a little bit uh, give me a little bit more encouragement about helping just Dale. Dale and I can stand up and talk to you all day long about all the benefits that we've gotten out of it, but it's good to hear uh, from some kind from somebody else. So keep that in mind. Um, before I get on to much more, any more questions, let me talk a little bit, and I'll ask Dale to help me out with this. These are the questions um, from last week, and these, some of these ones we didn't get a chance to get to them. Um, a lot of the questions had to deal uh, with life balance issues, family versus work, and I think Adam and John have had a couple of questions. There was another question this week had to do with life balance, um, and I'll kind of give you my shtick on it, and I'll let Dale kind of fill in. Uh, I was very fortunate in that, for some reason, the importance of work, uh, oh sure, thanks, um, uh, family and work, were very important to me. Uh, I don't remember when I came across that, but obviously I always put my family before work. There's no doubt about that. Now, uh, I think, uh, and one comment that I remember um, from working through this for many, you know, the, you know, my kids grew up, and you know, now they have their own kids and moved away. But you know, for the, you know, for the 18 or 20 years, you know, before they, you know, after they hit five or six, they become very, it's very crucial that you share some other things with these guys. Um, it became very evident to me that at that point in time, um, in the consulting business, you know, I had several clients I had to take care of. I was the president of WEF. Um, I, had to, I had to sell projects um, and it required me to travel all over the world, essentially. And it became very evident to me that how could I figure out, deal with, my clients, my uh, things that, that I'm committed to do, and take care of my family. And it, it became evident to me that for most of the time, dealing with clients or WEF, when I knew I had a family commitment, now, when I talk about a family commitment, going to, uh, don't want to miss a play for my kids or a uh, baseball game or doing, you know, soccer game or things like that. I mean, they're still pretty important to me, but I sit down and ask my clients. I say, do you mind, you know, you, you're, you, you want to get together, you want to schedule this meeting for for uh, Thursday in a couple weeks. I always ask, Could you, can we do it on Wednesday? And I would guarantee you 95% of the people would say, not a problem, we'll move back. Because that kind of movement Asking client allows me to change a meeting so I could stay home and do some things instead of leaving or having to get back early. So don't hesitate when you're dealing, you're trying to balance your work and your family, don't hesitate to ask about that. But obviously there are a couple things when you have a board meeting, a 
presentation. There's no way you're going to be able to get out of it because, you know, dealing with a board meeting, you know, it's a client, you got to be there. There's no doubt about that. So from time to time, but a very low percentage of time does that have an impact, at least on my career. And the nice thing about that is that when I retired from um, Black and Beach, it's a nice time to retire because you're still alive and you get a lot of nice comments from other people as opposed to whether, you know, you passed away and a lot of people say nice things about you, but you never hear it, so to speak. But again, I had a couple of the young professionals who came up with me that I had passed along the same comments to them. You know, they wanted to coach their kids' soccer team. And they, you know, they came and said, you know, your piece of advice worked very well because I was able to move some things around most of the time. So keep that in mind, guys. If you're looking how to balance things, don't hesitate to ask people. I always ran into a couple of people that were jerks and they wouldn't move anything. So, you know, you're running into those people from time to time. And obviously, if you have a death in the family or somebody's really sick, then I can't make the board meeting. Someone's going to have to go fill it for me. And again, those are some issues, some issues that come up that come up in everybody's lives. So, okay. I'll ask Dale. Any comments on life work balance you want to share Well, that's share with three, guys? really, to show you guys the roles, you know, that, and you have to decide what priorities those are. But once you decide, then you set goals and you stick to them. So that's why I think really that whole matrix in time management is to achieve that life balance in your different roles so that you uh, take care of those special relationships both outside of work and those at work. No, I, you know, again, we, I've seen guys in my career who are willing to work from 7 o'clock in the morning to 7 o'clock at night, five days a week that came in on Saturdays, and that's fine. They're very happy to do that. You know, they, they have another family, but I guess, again, they just work, they decide that's where I'm putting all my, all my energy. Um, so, again, it's a decision that you guys are going to have to come up with. So, um, so again, there are a lot of people that feel that way, and that, that's fine. Right? That's their choice. And how that works. So keep that in mind. Any questions about life work balance? Since I spend all the time talking about that a little bit. Uh, let's see. Uh, and I don't see John, I don't see John is in here. John is uh, he'd ask a question. Uh, do having egos help or hurt? I think Dale touched on this. Egos, does it help or hurt? If oh, it definitely ego, helps. You talked about that. If it's ego for the right purpose. That's the key thing. If you have ego for the team or ego for the mission, that's awesome. But if it's self-ego, that's, that's not good. Uh, one thing, Tim had asked a question about how do you teach ambition? <laughs> and um, my response is, uh, that's very difficult. <laughs> you, you can encourage people to have ambitions, but I don't know what it is, whether it's genetic or, you know, I'm not quite sure. I've never been able to figure out. I can encourage somebody to be ambitious to get some stuff done, but there's nothing. I've never found anybody to encourage that. I don't know, Dale, if you had run into anybody that didn't have ambition that you wanted to. I think ambition comes with passion. Maybe, maybe the passion isn't on the right, you know, arrow. Yeah, never know. Uh, I don't. So that was ambition. Uh, that was one of the questions um, that Tim had asked. But uh, you know, again, my dad um, started to work for General Matt, General Motors after he got out of World War II. Started to work for General Motors. He was maybe have told the story. He's polishing hubcaps, moon caps. They call them moon caps. That was he went to work. You know, he's probably 21 years old. Went to General, General Motors, polishing hubcaps. That was his job. He worked his way through to become a foreman and then become a white collar guy. For a little bit. But my dad told me he said, you know, what I always do at work, and this is when he worked for the union. He said, you know, I had a job to get this thing done. It required a couple. You know, people had to go through a couple of sets. He said, I figured out the laziest person, laziest man, because at that point in time, everybody worked for GM, probably working in his interview. I put the laziest guy I could find. 
because he'd figure out the easiest way to get something done. And then I'd move on and bring on the guy that liked to work with Ron Bishop and the production <laughs> skyrocket. So, for what it's worth, you know, every once in a while, dads leave you stories that are kind of worked out pretty well. So, kids don't keep that in mind. I, you know, again, I'm not quite sure how you could apply that here. But, uh, again, that's some kind of important question. Uh, most of the other questions have to deal with... Uh, Level five issues, and we'll get into those questions um, when we see that one. And talking about today, a lot of the questions dealt with win-win. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about the emotional or um, yeah, your your emotional bank account. So I think that's the that was you know a couple of the emotional bank account. I think we talked about that a little bit yesterday, but. Uh, before we don't know if we're going to go back to those, but a couple really good questions here. Um, you know, one of them came up with uh, how to build an emotional bank uh, after totally losing their trust. Um, <laughs> or how do you make big emotional uh, deposits? How do you make emotion, huge emotional deposits? Um, I don't know. In terms of losing trust, it's very difficult. That's something, like, you do something, um, you know, that's beyond, you know, not a, that's a little bit beyond withdrawal. Uh, you can't trust somebody. It's very difficult. Um, I think ultimately you can get back to that phase, but it'll take a little while rather than just making uh, positive deposits there. In terms of making, how can I make a huge deposit? It's very difficult. Again, I don't know. I've never been able to one big, huge deposit that would, you know, over-deposit my emotional account with my wife. Never admit to that point. And basically, I think the best thing is don't don't look for the one big deal. Just a little bit at a time. If you go through that, if you're looking at how to handle that stuff, yeah, just do it. Just do it a little bit at a time. So that would be my recommendation there. Um, we have a large deposit there, and then let me see what else we've got here. Uh, yeah, this has to do real with those. So that may be a light thing on the other, um, you know, your deposits and withdrawals. Any other questions, guys? Most of the stuff that you guys are given, they will kind of get into that. But anything else, guys, that you submitted and I missed it? You can't bring it up today. Okay. Well, again, I think uh, they will kind of go back, habit one, you know, being proactive and habit two, begin with the uh, first things first. I think they may go back and spend some, spend some time on other issues with time management, which is, again, very important, guys. If there's you know, one thing to be behind. And Cal's not going to be here this week, so again. Uh, and also, uh, I'm missing a couple of questionnaires. I've kind of sent out some emails, guys. I didn't get the questionnaires back because I can't put teams to get to do that. So I'm going to get that. Mr. Dale. Ready? You're ready. Yeah, yeah. I hope my voice. Now, that is, did they fix the, they fix the chalkboard? But well, now I don't need it. Thanks a lot, you guys. Oh, well. Okay. <laughs> That's all right. You can switch back to the uh, PowerPoint here. Thanks, well, I uh, I want to go back, kind of talk about some things that I covered real fast when I was here last week. And I didn't feel like that we were able to maybe set set those because uh, this win-win habit four as we go up to the uh, working with others and. Public victory. You know, it, it's really based on <coughs> character. It's based on uh, relationships. <laughs> and it's based on agreements. And one of the things I wanted, I was thinking, I want, I want you to connect some dots here, is that this leadership thing is about relationships. Big time. Um, and I was thinking back when... My younger days, I played athletics, and I was immature, and I was in it for me. I was on a team, but I was in that, in it for me. Uh, I wanted to be a Friday night hero. Football in Texas is huge, and uh, I kind of grew up in the uh, 
I did. I grew up in East Texas, and if you've seen the movie, uh, remember the Titans? Yeah. That that was that was me in in East Texas during that time. And uh, <coughs> it wasn't until I got older, and I did great, but the team did lousy. <laughs> but I really didn't care. And when I got more mature, you know, in business and stuff, boy, um, I hit a wall. And a lot of that, talk about ambition, you know, ambition can be deceiving. So if, I think it's, you'd have to ask yourself why. Why am I ambitious for this or ambitious for that? And if it's for building up the team, I would say go for it. Because if it's for building up yourself, I would say that's not long-term, highly effective. People will start dropping off around you, thinking, yeah, I see how this, you you with me? Y'all get that? That's very important. And uh, so when I came across this material, it was a time in my career that I had pretty much Maxed out. That's what I love about this level five thing. When I saw that, I said, "Man, I, that." So we'll get into that next time. Level five and, and uh, Collins is level one. Spot on. Spot on that research, and I've lived it. Um, so I, I go back. <coughs> leadership, high effective leadership. Number one, relationships. And so we talk a lot about uh, that in the public victory. Um, but before we get to that, we've got to you've got to you've got to conquer yourself and get yourself in the right frame of mind. That those relationships are key. You've got to believe that, and you've got to believe and know that the strength of a relationship is based upon trust. You break that trust. Um, I'm not saying you can't restore that relationship, but going into it, knowing, maintaining of trust is very important. It helps you stay focused on that. <coughs> um, some of those deposits that we talked about, I wanted to come back to those. Um, where was that? See, I'm going to be deliberate in going back and looking at my material, so y'all just bear with me. Because I, I was covering a lot of ground last week. <clears throat> oh, another thing I wanted to talk about, and I think we're, we're living an interesting time in history. You'll see. Time will tell. But when Covey and his research team started <clears throat> this project, just like Collins and his research team did their project, wrote a book, Cubby and his research team did their project, wrote a book. <coughs> what they discovered <coughs> was that for the first 150 years in their research from 1770, I mean, yeah, 1770 to 1920, success depended on things like integrity, humility, fidelity, temperance, courage, justice, patience, Industry, simplicity, modesty, and the golden rule. So I don't know how many history buffs we have in here, but think about think about 1770 through 1920, what was going on in the formation of this country, the industrial age. A lot of stuff happening that the success depended upon those things that I just read to you. And those are exactly what comprises the character, the character ethic. But then after 1920, the Roaring Twenties, it kind of switched. Success was a function of personality, public image, attitudes, behaviors, skills, techniques, the things that lubricate the processes on human interaction. And that's the personality ethics. And that drove success from 1920 to 1970. I was given a book when I graduated from high school or college. 
somewhere in there. It was a book a guy wrote. In the whole book, <laughs> what? I just know what you're going to say. I'm just laughing about it already. <laughs> it's was called Dress for Success. <laughs> really? I mean, but that was that was kind of what was going on, you know. Is you could you could be successful by the what you wore. So that was um, the personality ethic. So about 1970 is when I think <coughs> Covey was <coughs> doing their research, and I think he was seeing a need to swing this thing back more towards the character ethic. And so through the 1970s, 80s, 90s, whatever, you know, but we may be in for a, a shift here as we go forward. Um, be interesting. We'll see. We'll see how, how your group, how your group defines success and high effectiveness, what kind of leader that you will follow. We'll see. But anyway, <coughs> this material is definitely based upon the character, and those are the things that don't change. So when you look at a level five leader with the humility, I can tell you <coughs> a true story um, in Dallas um, there's a guy by the name of Ross Perot. He ran for president one time. And he started a company there, EDS, and he became a gazillionaire. And he, uh, I didn't know it, but there's a Dickie's barbecue on Forest Lane. Guys from the office, we'd go down there and eat barbecue at lunch. Somebody one time said, here comes, here comes uh, Ross Perot. And he drove this old Buick, cutlass, parked, got out by himself, came in, wore a not an expensive suit, and he sat and ate a barbecue sandwich just about every day. And uh, he just didn't have, you know, airs about him, but he was very loyal. You, you know, he got the guys out of what Iran, you know, his company, that story. Anyway, he was just one of those characters that, that he's, he's strong principled. You may not believe that, but the man is very strong principled, almost to a fault. You know, he's, he's rigid on those principles. <coughs> so, I wanted to start out with that, is that as we move into the public victory, the key is relationships. And you've got to shift from... Um, a me to a we. And as a leader, if you can't make that shift, people will see you, you'll be, I'm not saying you won't have some success and be effective, but we're talking here highly effective. We're talking highly effective. So. Bro, he, Texas Instruments, is that, what did he, what was the company? EDS, EDS. Electronic Data Systems. That's it, okay. That he sold to General Motors. General Motors. Yeah. He's still alive there in Dallas. Eighty-something years old. He's a true patriot. Uh, okay, anything y'all are kind of nodding? You, that sound good? Um, so this this trust. So if relationships, you don't learn that in engineering school. I didn't. I don't know where you learn that. Where do you learn that? Just trial and error, really. You know, unless you have a mentor, somebody that says, hey, look, let me tell you something. This is what's important. So I'm telling you, it's important. <coughs> um, and the relationship is as strong as the trust. Um, and these bank accounts are the basis of this trust. So let me read them off to you again. Understanding the individual. That's one. How do, you, how do you get to know and understand an individual? Being around them. 
spending time together. Listen to them? Yeah. Listen. Especially, exactly. Especially not just talk. So that is like, habit five. That's yeah. why I did not want to cover that today because it's so important. We're going to cover that next week. How to listen. Empathic, empathic listening. How to listen to somebody with an ear that you care that you're seeking to understand, I've already said the habit. I mean, <laughs> you're trying to get inside them and understand how they're feeling and why they're feeling that way. Um, attending to the little things. Attending to the little things. The little things. <coughs> Any examples? In this day and time, a little thing to me. Whether you eat or not, or something. What? Whether you had the meal or not. Listening to them, whether it's, it's about work or whether it's about <coughs> lunch or dinner. Or do they have some attention if he or she has some chain in their pajama or something like that? Um, when I think of little. What was the question? How do you Attending to the little things. Okay. I mean, for us guys, little things might be silly. Silly things, corny things, you know. But to some other people, little things, thank you. You know that? A card. Something as simple as a card, handwritten, putting a stamp on it and knowing that they went and put it in the mailbox. It doesn't cost a lot. I mean, that's a little thing, right? Or, um, I don't know, it seems like special occasions, birthdays, things like that, or whatever. If you have a coworker and they're having a hard day, but you know that they love peanut M&Ms. They, they just love it. And you set some peanut M&Ms on their desk without them knowing it. Who did that? That's a little bitty thing. <coughs> Another one, <coughs> keeping commitments. That's a big thing, keeping commitments. Um, talking about work-life balance, one of the commitments, you know, Keeping commitments can be not only to someone else, but they can be a promise you make to yourself in keeping that commitment. Um, I'm going to give you an example. One that I, I made to myself was when my son was born, and he was growing up, and he just he loved basketball. I mean, since he was a little bitty guy, just, you know. And so I made a commitment to coach his basketball team. And little did I know that that went for like six years. I mean, after they got out of, they were in high school, and they had a high school team. But in the off season, they needed a coach to play the city league. And I ended up doing that. <coughs> and but I kept that commitment. And those guys, I see them, I go to their weddings and everything, and now they're starting to have have their kids and stuff, and I know those guys because I coached them. You with me? And it meant a lot to them. <laughs> Keep, that was a commitment. Clarifying expectations is another one, a deposit. And I, I just zoomed right by this last week <clears throat> about um, stewardship delegation. But one of the keys in delegation and I guess that's why Covey put the word stewardship before it, is this clarifying of expectations. And the thing hard about that is it takes time. And usually when you're delegating, you're in a hurry. I mean, that's why you're delegating. You know, I've got time constraints on you. Here, you take this, you take that, you take that. And you just go right by the clarifying of, of what you expect. Um, 
showing personal integrity. Showing personal integrity. And that's how you behave or how you act when no one's looking. Until you didn't realize there was someone looking. It might have been your five-year-old son. Or it might have been that 25-year-old 20, engineer level one that had just gotten out of college that saw how you did talked, okay, that you didn't even know they overheard that conversation. Um, apologizing sincerely when you make a withdrawal. <laughs> Apologizing sincerely. So these are all deposits. <coughs> There's probably some other ones. Those are major ones. So building this trust. And, you know, trust is one of those things that's built almost over a, not a lifetime, but a long time. But man, when you've got it, uh, it's the basis of a, a great relationship. I think, guys, you know, from my perspective, uh, the one thing that I really focused on um, when I dealt with clients or people that <clears throat> I worked with, <clears throat> it wasn't just dealing with work or a special project, things like that. As, as Dale said, it takes time. And... The only time, the only time you spent with people that working for you or with you or clients, the only time you show up dealing with a job, again, very you don't build much trust in that, or, or um, you got to trying to become again trying to develop some sort of trust there. But again, as Dale said, if you show up, there's absolutely no project coming up. I go to a client, let's go out and have lunch, let's talk about that. And we swap stories about what our families are doing now, things like that. Didn't even talk about work at all. I had a, a senior partner when I was a young engineer. We took a couple of people out from a client, and I talked completely about completely other stuff. And went and the client, Chicago guys, loved me, he loved us because we've done this stuff. And he got kind of says, we didn't talk about work at all. <laughs> and I says... Well, yeah, that's that's the key thing. You don't have to talk about work all the time. So yeah. keep that in mind, guys. There's a lot of other ways to build trucks. I wanted to come back to habit two, beginning with the end in mind. I skipped right over this, but <coughs> Cubby uses the ultimate, beginning with the end in mind. This is about building your personal mission statement. This is really, I say, planting your flag is who are you? You know, the, what do you stand on? Who, who, who are you? What's distinctive about you? What are those promises that you've made to yourself? Those commitments that you say, this is, this is me. These are the building, basic building blocks of my character. This is me. And uh, he talks about, and I'm going to throw a twist to this, <coughs> that you uh, go to a funeral. Y'all read the book. And anyway, you go to this funeral and um, you go up the steps of the, they're having this funeral and go into the back door and uh, step inside and uh, sit down at the very back, sit down at the very back and they're just observing and everything and it dawns on you and you suddenly realize <coughs> that it's your funeral. This is kind of a dream, okay? This is, you got to go with me. <laughs> But he asked the question, who's there? Who gets up and speaks? Who wants to say something? And those that do, what do they say about you? I mean, that, that is really beginning with the end of mind, okay? <laughs> but I had something happen to me that I, it's your retirement part. Now, at that, or that, that, that occasion, uh, you get to actually be there. <laughs> and Dick and I have talked about it. I got some emails from some guys, some clients, some people that I was like, wow, I, I had no idea. I forgot all about that. 
And it, I, I just I saved those. I've got them at home, you know. It's like, ooh, ooh. It's my security blanket or whatever. You know? <laughs> you go, I go back and read my card. Yeah, I go back and read my card. I go back and read You know, but I get... Because <laughs> when you retire, <clears throat> you, you, uh, you leave all that behind. And if that's who you were or who you are, well, it, one of the, it ends one day, just like a professional athlete. You know, if you watch, I've been watching some of these ESPN things about these athletes that have such a hard time after they retire. And then there's others that don't, because they prepared for that occasion. But uh, beginning with the end in mind is that mission statement about what that's going to look like. And why it's going to look that way. So <clears throat> if, you can, if you can write that down, if you can verbalize that, then it gives you a laser-like focus then in moving to the next one, which is this time management thing. Because if you write that down and then you don't figure out how to manage, not lead, have it three is about managing. <clears throat> I used to think other guys somehow were given more time than me because they, their effectiveness was greater than mine. Then I realized we're, we're all given the exact same amount of time, right? Right? I mean, we may not be all, all be given the same amount of money, or looks, or what, but we are level with them. We're all given the same amount of time. You can't argue that, like, oh, woe is me. That's not, life's not fair. You got more time than I did. No, we're all given 24 hours in a day, blah, blah, blah. So habit three is all about <coughs> managing <coughs> that time in order to achieve habit two, which is that mission statement that you wrote. And the reason you were able to write that mission statement in habit two is because in habit one, you decided to be proactive. And you decided to open up your mind or renew your mind and not let your past situation, all of these things, keep you down. Okay. Yo, we're good? Am I preaching? <laughs> okay. Um, 4.15. Okay, this habit three about the, the putting first things first. Um, you know, the simpler you can make that, probably the better. Y'all heard about it, the 80-20 rule? No. No? What is it? <laughs> the 80-20 rule. Anybody? Isn't it that like 80% of the work is, you can get 80% of the work done in a certain amount of time, but the last 20% is really hard or something? I, or is that, am I thinking of the wrong one? Kind of, yeah. It's like, uh, let's say that we were given the same task and there were, um, Ten steps, and I focused on two of them, while you focused on eight of them. But my two were so leveraged against your eight, your eight that it produced a lot greater results than all of those times you were trying to spend on eight. You can figure out how to. Spend your time on the 20% that will create 80% type results. That, that is leverage, the 80-20. There's a book on that, <coughs> the 80-20 rule. It's generally true, generally true, that 80% of the results come out of 20% of a focused effort. Generally. Um, so putting first things first is all about figuring out 
what is the first thing to put first? And <clears throat> we talked about the, all these different roles. And going through that, and if they're high priority, then you need to you know, create goals and, and include those in your schedule. If they're not, they may drop off after a week and they weren't high priority. You misprioritized them in the first place. But how many of you have have uh, regretted, let's say, um, and it's usually, I don't know, families are tough. That, for me, that was where it was tough, that I had siblings, but I didn't uh, proactively manage the relationship. But when I did, I felt better about myself. You know, that's one of those things. So once you figure it out and you manage those things proactively, you generally feel better about yourself so that you're sharper in those, those other ones. Does that make sense? It's almost like you're, you're physical. You know, if you, <coughs> you, if you feel good, you do better, generally. And then you figure out, well, how do I get to feeling good? And we all know, you know, through diet, exercise, the right amount of sleep, blah, 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 blah. So it's like, well, and that's that goose and the golden egg thing we talked about. Well, if I set that as a priority and stick to it, make a commitment, a promise to myself, and do it, then you feel better. And generally, maybe the next, the next commitment is more effective. Um, in that time management, and that's where I was thinking, one of the keys there was the stewardship delegation that we talked about. I was thinking, what do you do when you don't have anybody to delegate to? You know, you're kind of a one... Remember the level five, level... Four, three, two, one. You're you're a one. You know, you don't have anybody that you can delegate to. So what do you do? Or do or do you truly not have anybody you can delegate to? I don't know the answer to this. I didn't ask it because I'm sitting here with the answer to hear what you're going to say. I truly don't have the answer. It's your time accordingly. You're like in the top or something. Might be able to delegate on something horizontally instead of vertically, depending on the size of your organization. Can I get someone from a different group to work on the same thing? You know, so maybe a peer to help me out or something yeah. like that. You could at least do some delegation that way. Yeah. Learning to say no if you're being tasked with a lot of things. You know, some some people I used to work with didn't have that, and they weren't able to say, oh, I, I can't take on this load, and they'll take it on anyway, and then they find themselves overwhelmed. So maybe that's a proactive way of not having to delegate, maybe. By, by, by filtering out. Yeah, that's, that's just being true. honest with yeah. your, your boss and saying, I, can't, yeah. I really can't yeah. take this on right now. Right. Yeah. For some advice to other people who have uh, faced with this kind of experience. Good. I brought that back up because in his setting, it's more in a team environment. You, you've got resources, you know, that you can delegate to. But I was got to thinking, well, what's in, what if you're in a situation of where you don't? So. <coughs> I, you know, creativity is always good. You find, I mean, it's amazing what you can, people around you that if you ask for help, maybe they would help you. If you ask. I was going to tell a, a true life story about delegation. Let's see. Um, there's an article. I'm going to mention it. 
I think Dick was going to send it out. Yeah, we'll have to, uh, yeah, the monkeys. <laughs> yeah, it's a. Uh, it was from the Harvard Business Review. Yeah, exactly. That this guy published back in 19. It's an old. I think it was 76 or something. Like that. Yeah, it's way back in time. <laughs> And it's like one of the top two. You know, when I was the age of these guys in the classroom. <laughs> but what makes it cool is it's, to this day, is one of the top two uh, articles in, in the Harvard Business Review. And it's about, really about time management and, and who's got the monkey. And um, I, I live this. I had a boss that... Um, turned out to be a great mentor to me, but when I was young, I would go into his office with a problem. And I didn't I wouldn't have gone in there if I hadn't have needed his help. And really what I wanted him to do was all his wisdom and experience, he's my boss, right? Tell me what to do. But he never would. <laughs> he would sit there and say, well did you uh, he'd ask questions. And then I would leave, and I didn't, he didn't tell me, he didn't answer it for me. Now, this monkey analogy is about, and I had this, I had to learn it. <laughs> there would be somebody come in, hey boss man, yeah, got a minute? Yeah, sure, what's up? comes in, when they walk in, they have this monkey on their shoulder. <laughs> and so through this conversation, because I'm a nice guy and I'm the boss, he leaves and that monkey's now on my shoulder. Just because of something little that I said, yeah, I don't have time right now, but I'll look into it. Well, as soon as he said, I'll look into it, he left. <laughs> waiting on me, right? I mean, there's an art to this. And then that afternoon, another one comes in, and all of a sudden, they got another monkey, and before you know it, there's just monkeys all over my office. <laughs> and I can't get anything done, because I've... So this article is talking about that, and about, you know, managing time and not delegating. Well... I had run across this material at a certain time, and I underlined this because I wanted to tell you a true life story because what he said was so true. I think that's on, was on first page. I had an electrical engineer. Or was it on Guppies, the gorillas? Yeah. Yeah. Cubby followed up with making time for gorillas back here. Uh, in 99, he wrote this about, about this. <laughs> and he said, the reason when you give problems back to subordinates to solve themselves, I did, you have to be sure that they have the, both the desire and the ability to do so. So I had this project, <clears throat> I was a project manager, we had mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, structural engineers, civil engineers, process engineers, all different engineering disciplines. <coughs> We're always having problems with the electrical. <laughs> Not being coordinated with equipment or you know, this sort of thing. And so the project was actually going to construction, and I get a call from the guy out in the field. It's a water plant. And he said, man... He said, uh, we got a problem out here, da 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 And I just, uh. so I walked down to the electrical engineering department, and there was this engineer, and I thought, it's his problem. He's, he caused it. So I said, you need to go drive out there, get with the field representative, the resident engineer, and get this thing solved. So he goes out there, <laughs> he comes back. Before he could get back, the field resident called me and said, 
The client said, don't ever send that guy out here again. <laughs> he ticked off everybody. <laughs> so what I didn't realize was it says uh, you have to be sure that they have both the desire, of which he didn't. The only reason he was doing it is because I came back there and I used my position over him and the ability, and he had no bedside manner at all. Okay, And this was delicate situation that required some interpersonal skills and communication skills and listening, seeking first to understand, and uh, I'd seen him out there, and he went out mad, and he came back mad, and the whole problem got bigger. <laughs> so... I underline that little little tidbit there. I, I think, guys, a, a couple things, too. Just And I'll upload it, this article. Um, but there's a great, and again, these are the things I like to extract quotes that make a big impact with me, that stick with me. Uh, they say in the, in the uh, uh, monkey article, in accepting the monkey, the manager has voluntarily assumed a position of subordinate to his subordinate. Again, that's kind of an important and I hate to use the term subordinate, but that's, you know, every once in a while, that's what you got to talk about. So I think that's the, that, keep that thought in mind that when somebody comes into your office or asks you to do something, it's, you know, it's very seldom you say, okay, I'll look into it. Try to avoid that whenever you can, because number one, they won't learn anything if you look into it and let them know. They, they just won't figure it out. So it's a lot more important for them to say, well, give some suggestions and then let them go with you. So, kind of keep that in mind. How do you balance that with also being a servant leader who is trying your best to help mm -hmm. out your subordinates? Mm -hmm. Good question. So, um, could easily turn into seeming non empathetic degree. It starts to me with. Um, Relationship, it's, it's warm, fuzzy things. How do you balance that? It's that um, patience, uh, understanding. I mean, the guy's name was Clois. Y'all don't know him, but Clois had no business going out there in the fields. You know, he went out there because I ordered him to. And I shouldn't have done that. Um, <clears throat> but I did. But, you know, maybe I should have said to the guy on the phone, give us a little bit, let's look into it. Maybe I should have gone to his department head, his supervisor, John, we got this situation. I'd like for you to, you know, I don't know, but I, I just, I went, who, who designed that? And that was not the right thing to do. Um, so I think when we're going to, you know, if you're getting into servant leadership, level five leadership, um, it's really, you're now you're really getting into things of valuing the other individual, respecting the other individual, and uh, which takes a lot of you know, patience, understanding, and having the relationship to know what their constraints are, what their skills are, what their things like that. Um, I'm glad you asked that because in that situation, my care was not about Clovis. Right? At all. Had it been, had it been, I may have, had I been more mature and sat back and said, hmm, this would be a really good learning for Clovis who designed that. What would be the best way? And maybe I talked to his supervisor or whatever, and we had the best for Clois in mind rather than that phone call that came in. And that, it's just, it's a paradigm shift, you know. <laughs> what are you laughing at? Uh, no, I just, no, I just, you know, I just read. <laughs> You're okay, teaching, you're teaching me again. Before you move on, go to win. Are you ready to go to think win win? 
I don't know, are we? I, I want to go back to time management, if you got a minute for me. I was going to ask them, I haven't interacted with our... Oh, there's... Anyway. Oh, the other thing, one comment too, you, you talked a lot about level five, we all talked about that, guys. You guys submitted a lot of questions on level five, and they're great questions, but again, we'll get to it, I think, uh, next week, so that's the important thing I want you to think about, for, you know, just skipping over level five, because it's a lot of great questions, so... But, yeah, but I wanted to go back to time management at some point in time. Well, to finish finish that up. Yep. I can't resist. Yeah. I had a chalkboard and they fixed it. I just and, and the reason, guys. I again, I, we always. Uh oh. Let's try oh, look at you and your oh, magic board. Absolutely. Cat and Dan, yeah, your magic just, legs. You know, there's very few things I can do in the IT group that uh, you know. It's, it's and again urgent. Not urgent. I, put, I guess I should put this thing uh, because this is urgent. And this is important. Um, so the thing, and again, if you think about urgent and important in this box and uh, it's not urgent, but important here. And I won't, I won't mess with the other two boxes down here. But um, the, guys, when I talk to people who have read Seven Habits, especially the three students that have come up to me over the five years I've been here, they walk in my office and they have a book. Or, you know, they talk about it. The key point when I ask them, what are two or three things in Seven Habits the most important thing? Of all those students, have always said one of whether it's first or third. Time management is the key thing, guys, and that's the key thing. And really, what you're doing here, you need to try to stay as much time in box two the best you can. Because I can just guarantee you, again, looking back on my career and knowing other people, um, you feel a whole lot better. If you stay in box two as much as you can, because from time to time you're going to end up in box one. You can't avoid it. Don't, don't worry about that, that you're there. Just get it done and try to get back to things that are important but not urgent. If you can do that, number one, you'll sleep better at night. I have no doubt about that. If you know you have a plan and it's not due in two hours or I have to get up at four in the morning to go and finish up this thing or I stay up until four o'clock in the morning to finish it up, avoid that whenever you can. Because you'll sleep better. There's no, but you'll feel better. Um, I think, you know, I'd like to say you make you help you live longer, but that's probably not appropriate. I don't know if that's true or not. Who knows? I don't have any control over that. But again, all that's kind of connected. So guys, in terms of time management, if you walk out, and I know the guys in the, <laughs> in the fall course are tired of me revisiting this, but I can't, I can't, I, I don't give a darn. I'm going to tell you, try to stay in box two, whatever you can, guys. Just try to, just, Pile as much on it. And from time to time, you got to get in three and four. Don't worry about it. But just don't spend a lot of time on Facebook or doing a lot of Facebook, whatever that is. Don't spend a lot of time on that stuff with your face buried or something. Also, we avoid the stress. What's that? How do you? If we are in the box two, also, we avoid the stress and other things. Oh, absolutely. Because we remember exactly. Well right. You can, again, you can try to stay out of box one as much as you can, although from time to time, you can't avoid it. You just, things, emergencies come up, you can't avoid it. And don't just get to this point, oh, I don't want to waste my time doing this other stuff. Because at, at my career, when you get this old, uh, after you, you know, spend all day long and then you teach for three hours, you go home, trust me, I don't jump right back to figure something else I can do, you know, in, in the kitchen. So I'm like, I go, I sit down, I turn on TV, and I watch an hour, two hours of TV, where my mind just can disappear. I don't. I just enjoy and laugh watching stuff on deep, whatever it is. And I try to avoid the news whenever I can these days, but that's kind of how it goes. So the important thing is, guys, don't you know? Don't hesitate to try to get in box three and four from time to time, but don't spend all your time. Sorry, I can't. I can't resist. It's your show. I'm just no, no, no. You're the you're the main guy here. But go ahead. You, know, you can put the. PowerPoint back on up there. So thanks, guys. Well, I'm going to go for about another 10 minutes, I guess. We'll take a break. Introduce this habit for.
So where we are, you know that. Habit three, we're assuming that you have uh, decided that you can be proactive, that you can separate the stimuli from the response, all those things, that your circle of influence is greater than your circle of concern, and um, you've really won your private victory, which is the war against yourself. And, you know, we all have our, <coughs> our things about us, whether it's a short fuse or forgetfulness or whatever. But, you know, you've, you've come clean. You've, you understand yourself. Uh, and you've decided to launch a new mission and get organized, and you've got a tool to help you manage your time and this sort of thing. So now you're ready to go out. And really, about now, um, in my career, in this triangle that we're going to go over next week, but I, I just will go up it, uh, we're going from level one to level two. Because when I started at Black and Beach out of college, I was a level one engineer, and I sat in a cubicle, and something was brought to me, and I did the work. And I remember the first day, I was like, oh, man, i got to do this all day? Because the days just seemed to be so slow, you know, and everything's I, I wasn't into it yet. But So there for a while, the rule of thumb back then, I don't know if it still is now, but you're a one for one, a two for two, a three for three, and what that means is your, your promotion, you would, you would stay at a level one engineer for a year. And, I mean, if you were tracking average, I guess, you would then be promoted to a level two engineer, and you would stay at a level two engineer for two years. Then you'd go to a level three engineer, stay there for three years. At that point, <coughs> that's three Two is five. You've got about six years of experience. You apply for, you can get your PE license, your professional engineer registration. And with that, now you're ready to become a project engineer at level four. And all this time, you've got more people reporting to you. But at a level one, you have nobody reporting to you. At level two, it might be you become a level two, and hey, that new graduate is sitting there that you're now the one giving those papers to that you did last year. With me. So we're, we're just now going into level two engineer. Imagine yourself, you got one other person fresh out of college uh, reporting to you, and you're at, the expectation is that you're, you're going to produce more because you've got yourself, and now you've got this person. And not only are you going to produce more, <coughs> you're going to develop this person so that they can produce more. And, um, but you didn't, you didn't pick this person. <laughs> so when this person comes to you, let's just play a game here. You couldn't be any more different. Personality-wise... Whatever. I mean, you're kind of extroverted, and let's say this person is totally introverted. Hello? You know, I can't get a person to talk to me. They're shy. I don't know if we're, I don't even know if I'm reaching this person. Or the work that I get back, I'm disappointed with. I mean, that's the real life stuff you get into. All right. Okay, six paradigms of human interaction and five dimensions of win-win. This pretty much are the six. You can go for a... Let's, let's start out with an easy one. Well, it's Super Bowl Sunday. Which one of those up there would represent Super Bowl Sunday? Win-lose. Win-lose. Win-lose, win <laughs> There's a winner, and there's a loser, right? Um, this one, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Let me make sure. Yes, yeah, yeah. Anyway, 
Lose, win. Lose, lose. You're not going to win. And I may not win. I'm going to do everything I can to cause you to lose, even if it means me losing. Because I, I am so focused on beating you until <laughs> I forgot about me. <laughs> we see it all the time, guys. Uh, you know, now and in the past. Lose, <coughs> lose. The divorce example in the book was kind of funny. I don't know how yeah. it panned out, but <laughs> yeah. I wasn't sure if that's legal to do that. Um, but, yeah. When that's just like you don't even exist, you know. I, I don't even acknowledge you. I'm just after a win here. That might have been me earlier when I was in high school, Friday Night Lights mode. The win was me. You know, I wanted to achieve my my win. Um, the highest one is the win-win. We both win. And the lowest, or, as you'll see, there's there's win-win or no deal. If, if we both can't win, if I can't get what I need out of it and you get what you can need out of it, then let's just not, let's just not enter into the, this, whatever this is. Okay? <coughs> okay. Again, uh, this is this habit is think win win. It's your it's your attitude. It's your it's not we're not talking do win win. We'll kind of get into that. But this is just going in initially. That is your uh, your goal, your attitude, how you approach it. Is that we're both going to win here? And to do that, here's. Your quadrant two. Notice everything important in quadrant two. But to get there, you look at the level of courage it takes and the level of consideration. So high, high, high courage, high consideration is that quadrant. And then over here, low, low is low courage, low consideration to lose, lose. Make sense? Questions? So, the win-win, again, seeks mutual benefit. It's cooperative, not competitive. Based on principle, we talked about what principles, and it's based on plenty for everyone. In other words, the there's enough. To, we don't have to get greedy here, you know. Nah, that's mine. Give me that. You know, there's plenty enough. Oh wait, there's enough here for everybody. <clears throat> and I'll tell you, when you're in an environment that the culture is a competitive culture, this is tough and may not be the right place to be. Uh, any of you, I watched the other night, I was just curious, I should have watched it earlier. Anybody watch the uh, documentary on Enron? Y'all know about Enron? I, I know about it. I was, it was on my watch list, but I never watched it actually. Wow. Wow. That's uh, interesting how that, 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 that culture, it just, it just destroyed people's principles. And they didn't even know it was happening, you know, because the reward system, reward, anyway, we'll get into reward systems here, but watch that documentary. It's very interesting. It's a true story. True story. It happened right there in Houston, Texas. Um, the title? Mm-hmm. Enron. The title? E-N-R-O-N. What did you ask? The title for this documentary that you say. The title. The doc- Enron. E N. R-O-N. It was a uh, uh, discovery or something like that. Yeah, Enron, E-N-R-O-N. It was a business that was founded in Houston in the oil, oil and gas space, and it rose up to be like one of the top five companies. And it crashed. It failed, and it ruined people's retirements, Everything. I think there was even some violation of some oil spill. No. 
Mm-mm. SEC, all kinds of all stuff. kinds of stock trading, voodoo accounting. Anyway, all right. Go a little bit longer here, and then we'll take a break. <coughs> Win lose. I've seen this. I've been a. I've been a. I've been a. I've been here on this. I'll give you an example on here. Uh, you know, you can work for different types of client organizations, and that organization can be a bully organization. And you know, it's all about them, and you lose. I don't care if you lose money. You sign the contract. Yeah, but in order to sign the contract, you were going to give it to my competitor unless I signed it for that. Well, you shouldn't have signed it, but you did, so you're going to do it now. I mean, that's a, that happens. And that's that authoritarian approach. They've got the power. They've got, they're the client, and they're going to will it on you, and they don't care if you lose or not. Let's get my project done. Yeah, I've seen clients, guys. You start off as a win-win. You sign a contract. You have a scope and a budget. From time to time, <clears throat> client will come in and say, "Hey, could you do this?" Well, sure, we can do. We can do. Yeah, we can do additional scope work, but we're going to have to add to our, to our costs because we got to do this. Well, we can't do that. No, no, no. Because I'm going to ask you to do this. You're never going to get another contract. I mean. And then these are the issues that when you talk about win lose. Oh. Now, not everybody is that way. I would not say that at all. But I want to. You run into it. I want to tell you that I just thought of this story. It's great for this. And then we'll take a break. I was working for. We were. We had a client that was this. the The head guy was this, and everybody was in fear of him. And he had a reputation for that. And. Um, on this particular, and I was a new project manager, and he beat me down for on our engineering fee, but we took it, and on that project, I lost money, and I was in, I was in trouble. And, but his number two man, I had developed a relationship with. Okay, and. It was right at the end of this guy's career, and he retired. As he was retiring, he appointed his number two man to replace him, my guy, that I built this relationship on trust and everything. When that guy got in to be the number one man, on the next project, he sold sources. We got through negotiating. said, you got enough money in there? I said, yeah, I do. He said, how much did you lose on that other one? I told him, he said, add that to that fee. I'll take it to the board and get it approved. That's a true story. And that guy was a friend of mine for life. We did a lot of work together. And I would fall on my sword for him. And he retired the year before I did. And we became good friends. We still call each other and everything for you know, he made a major deposit, but he had watched me be forthright and honest and treated bad. So, um, it, it, good guys do finish things <laughs> first. It may not have been that time, but uh, it, it's the right thing to do. Well, let's take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back and spend an hour finishing this one up. Thanks, guys. Okay. Well, let's talk about five dimensions of win-win. You see the three. And I mentioned that you know how strong character, relationships, these agreements, and then these are the other two. Sometimes you miss them down here, but unless you, if you have your supportive systems and your processes are not in alignment with a win-win, it can create the win-lose. And I mentioned the Enron story, but uh, some examples, you know, are, are your, uh, your compensation process or your reward processes. If, if you're rewarded on a competitive 
nature. It's not, you know, supporting the uh, the win-win. So, just want to make a point. We don't have to get into that, but in all businesses, uh, there's all those underlying support systems and processes. <coughs> I don't know that I need to spend a lot of time on this, but this integrity and maturity and abundance mentality, because when you get into this win-win, trying to get that agreement, this is so important to have. If, if you're not exercising strong integrity or maturity uh, or this abundance mentality, it's hard to, um, hard to get a win-win. The second one is these relationships that I mentioned. I covered this pretty heavy uh, here earlier about how these relationships are built on trust, high trust, the bank accounts are high, credibility is not at an issue. One of the things you <coughs> realize as you get working in the industry is you start establishing a reputation. That reputation <laughs> travels without you. It travels in spite of you. <laughs> As an example, you work for this client, you do a project for them. That client's at a professional AWWA conference or whatever, and they're thinking about using you, your firm, and they ask them, How, what was your experience like? That's that reputation. And um, so maintaining your credibility, uh, very important. Not only internally within your organization, but a lot of externally within your profession. And again, it relies on your uh, credibility as well. It's not yeah. just the company. Yeah. So keep that in mind, guys. Yeah. It happens all the time. Yeah. And it's amazing how in a profession, I guess it's like any profession, um, there are those those firms, those businesses that don't have an abundance mentality. And they don't think there's enough work for, for everybody. And so, um, you know, it's not a Pollyanna world. I mean, they, they're a competitor. And so, you gotta, you gotta have your credibility at not any issue so that as this person speaks maybe about you without you being there. Hey, it's not an issue, you know. We and if you can build that, it's a real strategic advantage or a sales advantage for you. You know, maintain your professionalism, maintain your <coughs> your clients, <coughs> and that helps build those repeat businesses. Repeat business that. They value the experience that they had with you. And then these agreements. Um, this was kind of the, not kind of, it was, this stewardship delegation that we talked about earlier. These were right in line with those, but it's amazing if you use these in negotiating an engineering contract, it sounds kind of silly, but it, and it takes time, but if you can start off with picturing, I mean, if you're not picturing the same thing as your client's picturing, you know, and the more you can describe, remember I told you all about things are created three times? One, the first time it's created is in your mind where you can describe it. The second time it's created on paper where you can show it to a client for them to review it. And then the third time is you give that to a contractor that they, they build it. But at the very beginning, if you can, if you can talk about uh, the desired results, and this not only is what it's going to look like, but desired results on what's important as far as how it's going to function. Is it user friendly? Is there a lot of high sophisticated technology? Or is it you want to dumb it down to where the, op, you know, it, it, these are all options, you know. That, no, we want to put the plant in, in the operator's hands. Okay. 
um, just all these kinds of things that you can spend a, a whole afternoon workshop talking about the desired results. And this isn't only with their upper management. This is with the different departments, the process department, their electrical department, talking about switch gear, talking about valve actuators. Talk, I mean, and the, the more you can drill down at that point, the better off you are. And then the guidelines, you know, so just talking about uh, how do we handle uh, scope creep. Dick kind of alluded to that. Now, that you haven't even signed a contract yet, okay? But you're talking about scope creep because, you know, so it's like, and again, if you've got this relationship based on trust, you go, look, no, seriously, if your uh, mechanical department comes in and wants bigger and more and da 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 da, and it's like, this is getting, how do we handle that? I mean, do you want me to step out of the room and come talk to you at the fear of making them mad because I've gone around them? Or do you not want me to get more? No, no, Dale. You know. So those are the top things of guidelines as to how we handle things. The resources, Mr. Client, are we going to have access to your... Um, to some of your operators, are you going to give us access, make time available where they can come out of the plant and sit down with us at a certain point in the project where we can talk about controls and da 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 da, da things that are going to, because they're, they're the ones that are going to have to operate this. So let's get their involvement in now. And we'd like to have, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll make that available to you. Just, I'm just throwing out examples of real world type things. <coughs> Accountability. You can ask, what are you going to hold me accountable to? And they may, well, the last engineer that was in here, you know, they may have these horror stories, you know. We're going to hold you accountable that you've got it up. And you, it may not be something you've even be thinking about. <laughs> and then the consequences. <coughs> And it's amazing when you start flushing these things out how easier it is to reach agreement than to have these little hidden, little hidden agendas and everything. Hey, Dale. Yeah. This is Megan. Um, I, I just uh, was wondering if we could talk about these agreements and all of these um, sort of bullet points here in terms of like a, a supervisor subordinate relationship because this is actually the most interesting part of the reading to me personally this week um, just because I <laughs> this is part of what I struggle with at work I think the most and what I um, I sort of wish for more in my <laughs> place of employment and I know I'm not sure who it was who asked the question earlier about the, um, the service leadership, but I, I think this is the part of the reading that really spoke to that. And um, I, I found the passage that I thought was really interesting about the boss becoming the first assistant to each of his subordinates mm -hmm. um, when talking about win-win performance agreements. And I think for me, in my experience, both having a couple of really good supervisors, a couple of really bad supervisors, and then last summer I had an intern, which was my first supervisory experience, um, that this was a really interesting concept because I didn't really understand what was going on at first when these really great supervisors were doing this for me, but then when I had to do it for someone else, it, it sort of became clear that you have to delegate things that you know that they may not, um, your subordinate may not understand or find the right answer be the, the, the part of delegation is giving it to them anyways for the learning experience and knowing that there's probably a 110% chance they're going to come back to you with either the wrong answer, a bunch of questions, or something like that. But that's, that's the situation I learned where I don't say, okay, let me look into that because I haven't even figured it out yet. It's, okay, I give it to them, and then while they're doing it, I do the work myself, find the right answer, 
And that's a situation for me where I was learning how to be a supervisor, but I, I feel like later on you become accustomed to figuring out exactly what your subordinates are capable of and saying, okay, I know that you can go find the answer. I'm not going to take this on myself. Please, you know, go ahead and try to execute this on your own. If you have any questions, come back and ask me, but this is something that I know that you can accomplish. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, uh, I was just, what you just said, <clears throat> I, don't, I forget where I was reading it. Oh, oh, it, it was this morning at the airport in Dallas. Uh, I was reading the Wall Street Journal. It happened to be there on the seat next to me. And the guy had written an article about um, supervising. And that very thing was, was the point of the article was that if you supervise, I mean, the reason you're a supervisor is you've already become accomplished at these particular tasks. Those are the tasks that you shouldn't do. Those are the tasks that you're helping this person do and struggle with and, and learn how to do because they're tasks you've already accomplished. So you're learning new tasks while they're learning new tasks. Does that make sense? Because if, if you're constantly focused on continuing to do what you've already learned to do, then you're not growing and that person working for you is not growing because you're taking their work away. Is that, you said that, right? Yeah, that's pretty much exactly what, what was going on. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so for me, the, the, whole, the, the biggest problem with um, my work environment is the last thing on that list, which is consequences. And because I work in a public sector job, um, I know they went through a couple, he went through a couple things, you know, financial consequences. That sort of thing is never going to happen for me because everyone gets paid the same amount depending on what your position is and how long you've been there. Like anybody can look up salaries and you don't get bonuses or anything like that. Um, and then it's really difficult for them to impose other sorts of consequences too. So, I, uh, such as you know being demoted or getting in trouble at work. It's just the structure of a public organization and being a civil servant and having a civil service board that's willing to defend you even if you may not be the most shining employee. Um, the, <laughs> the, the intricacies make it difficult, I think, at my job to have really meaningful consequences. So I feel like people don't even try to form these sorts of performance agreements because they don't see the, the point, or I, I'm not really even sure. I haven't figured it out yet. But. Well, <clears throat> let me ask you this. Do y'all have performance reviews? Uh, yeah, but everyone gets a meet standard. <laughs> uh, I, I had, a, I had my <laughs> fight for my um, exceed standard, which was my second performance review working um, for my employer. And uh, it went up the chain of command and got one step the first time. Then they knocked it back saying, oh, she hasn't been here long enough to get an exceed standards. And he wrote a long letter saying, this is not about how long she's been here. This is about the job that she is being trained to do now, and she's exceeding standards. Went up further in the chain. They knocked it back because of something else. So it's just, yeah, uh, it's not, not an efficient program <laughs> at all. For okay, well, when you become king... <laughs> then you can change things because you're you're learning a lot of good a good uh, it's a good learning platform and I, you know that's all I can say is is I, I think and again Megan I think that happens in a lot of utilities um, again I, I'm very close to several utilities and some of them it's very difficult you know the consequences are a little it's not written down. The only consequences I've seen at some utilities is that they don't get promoted at a specific time that they put in on their job. There's no guarantee on their next promotion. Now, I don't know if you have that uh, ability or not. Yeah, um, but there are, there are people like notorious in the organization for fighting and litigating even for their promotions right. because I, they feel like they're unjustly I, not being promoted yeah. even though. 
in, in that in that situation, life's too short. In my yeah. opinion. Yeah. Again, I'm not telling you to quit because you have a great employee, so there's nothing like that. But it's things like that that you probably have to think about. And yeah. You know, be some other Pick your battles. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry, I think I cut Justin off at one point when I was talking. I don't know if you. Oh uh, yeah, I was. Uh, I just said boo. So get standards every time. I thought that was Dave that said boo, but I don't know. Um, but a, about your point, Megan, I this morning actually just rolled out uh, 2017 development plans for my staff, which is four people, and I used this same model: um, desired results, guidelines, resources, and consequences. And for yeah. the consequences, I put. Uh, positive, negative, and neutral, but related it more to their growth as an employee and also their value to the team. Yeah, I think if there was more of that on an individual basis, I, I think it would work, but um, trying to get everyone in such a large, I mean, my organization is very large, so in that situation, it's like you just have to sort of do a team-by-team -team basis and your circle of influence is all you can really. Right. Let me let me ask uh, uh, Dave and Brian in the service. When I was in there, you get I had an OER. I don't think all the OERs get that. And everybody had at that stage, everybody got the same score. I mean, unless you really screwed up. Big time. And then when you got promoted, it was pretty much time and you know time and running, time and grade. Is that still that way in the service, or has it changed? Uh, up through major, I guess I, my major four just results just came out, and that was only seventy percent. I said only, but yeah, uh, hundred percent of the people wanted to get promoted, and they only picked the top seventy percent. Right. Mm -hmm. Until that point, it's pretty much the same, and it's just kind a of basic thing. thing. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, you, you're sitting in a group, and you're all right, same time in for that thing, and you know, it's like we all been here for three years, we all are the same rank. <laughs> I'm, I feel like I'm drowning and I'm watching someone else play solitaire or you know, <laughs> free Facebook, right? So I'm like, but we're getting the same pay yeah. every two weeks, irrelevant of performance. And then it gets to the point, this can be part of bureaucracy of, you know, I'll say performance punishment. I don't know if you've heard that term before, but okay, well then I'm going to lean harder on the people that I know are going to deliver because my boss has a deadline for his boss. I'm and sure. I can take the time to teach Dave how to do it or do this or the person that doesn't care, doesn't have a desire or the ability, or I can just say, hey, just keep playing solitaire, because I'll at least get it done with my two people <laughs> instead of my three people. So then it's a self-fulfilling prophecy negatively at times. Uh, not be a Debbie right, Cameron, and then, Sorry. No, so it's not going to be all like, you know, doomsday. But, yeah. Yeah, then, but then there is light. I mean, I think kind of at the bottom, when you're a level one leader, your job is just to take what's on your, you know, put it, here's an input and give me an output. You know, you're, you're a cog. So, it's frustrating to see I, I have a vision or I want to do this or implement change, but then you may not know the big picture all the time depending on the level of you know, responsibility and what you see and don't see within an organization. So, you know, your sphere of influence is you feel like it should be bigger, but maybe it shouldn't be too. Like learning where you can contribute and when you can reach out and make like a positive growth and impact that may be outside your pay grade or your role, but you know you'll deliver. Uh, is a, I think a key point to you know pick your battles accordingly because you're not going to get many and if you're constantly <laughs> picking battles then you're just going to get ignored when you actually do have a really good idea. Yeah, and for uh, the Navy on our side, we've uh, got a small community. There's only 1,200 total officers worldwide, and that includes uh, ranks from 01 all the way up to 08. So it's uh, our since it is small, we like to take care of each other. Uh, so, like he was saying, whenever you're a lieutenant or captain equivalent, if you have seniority, they try to take care of you to make sure that you are board ready for major or lieutenant commander in our case. And so, you know, it, it, it depends on where you're at and, you know, what community you are, definitely. So the smaller company, per se, that you're with definitely mm -hmm. should be taking care of their employees more. Uh, but the bigger ones, it gets complimented, I've, I've seen. Unfortunately, it only goes to those who actually show up and actually show themselves in front of the other leaders uh, that actually get ahead, and of course their output as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, yes, I had a comment on that. So one of the things that, you know, is common in research, I mean, of course, 
kind of more similar to public services, you know, you can always just have the people that might just punch in, punch out, do the minimum. But at the end of the day, like, getting them to see the vision of, like, why they want to do this, why they should be interested in it, and then also to see, also to show them, well, you know, if you do participate and make a big difference in this project, that's something that you can push on your resume so that you can um, um, get yourself to a higher level or a better job position later on. So maybe at your level, unfortunately, it might just, that might be um, the height of your influence level is just trying to get people to understand that being a big part of these projects does that give them opportunities later on and really push that is the reasoning why they should be putting in the effort. And if they don't put in the effort, then they don't really get to put their name in for the project. So, Well, you know, my, I always try to look for commonality. I mean, what, what do we share? I mean, do we, do we share the mission of the organization? Does the organization have a mission? No. Uh, this is Julie. I just wanted to comment. Um, I think my experience right now is kind of different. So I work for Eagle County, and I'm in the engineering department. And we're very small, so we have one county engineer and four en four other engineers, and we all report to her, and we all have our own little spheres of what we do because we need to get the work done. Um, so, you know, I do the same type of stuff that my 30-year-old and 40-year-old other engineers do as a 25-year-old. Um, they're, they're, not, they're not managing people either. Um, but the issue that we have with our organization is that we have county commissioners that have a four-year term. And every time we get new county commissioners, their ideals change, what they want to go for changes, how they want to spend money changes, which, you know, in engineering, when you're trying to get grant money to do projects, when you're, you have a four or five year project on the horizon, and sometimes we can lose funding or lose the support from the new county commissioners that come in, which kind of trickles down so we're, we're constantly in flux and once you get settled you've got someone new in office who <coughs> doesn't know the way it works and pretty much my boss directly reports to the county commissioner so there's not a lot of hidden stuff going on like if I screw up the commissioners will hear about it and my boss will hear about it um wow. it's just hard to keep up with I don't know it's it's small which is good because you know everyone but it's it can definitely be a struggle for everyone to always be on the same page. Yeah, yeah. No, well, I could see that, especially with the four-year terms and a new commissioner coming in and having a different agenda over four years, it reprioritizes. But. Well, again, I'll go back to this course is not seven habits of non-effectiveness <laughs> or medium effectiveness. It's, you know high effectiveness. So you could see that in a not in a perfect world, but I mean and good to great was the same thing. That that was looking at good companies. They were good companies. But then there were some that even though they were good, they moved to great. And so they were trying to determine what were these commonalities that caused these companies to move to great. So understand, I mean this stuff is um, Highly effective. I mean, we're, we're talking cream. What are the best of the best do? That's how we put it, you know. What are the best of the best doing? So keep that in mind. And don't uh, hit down on yourself or your, your, your employer or, you know, what, where you are right now. Because you never know when you can, your circle of influence does touch out to somebody. I mean, you can be a positive or a light uh, in a, Otherwise, what might be a negative situation that you could, in a small way, uh, create a better environment. Let me go to um, the next one. And that's these uh, four and five, which kind of get sometimes overlooked, but they're so important. Uh, I mentioned the systems and the processes. 
And you say, well, what, are, what type of systems, uh, the reward systems, we talked about that. What type of training systems do you have in place? And in my career, sometimes maybe it wasn't compensation that was the reward. It was the training that I got rewarded with. Okay? So it was, if I did this, and the agreement was I could go to a seven habits course in whatever, okay, that I saw that, man, I, I'd really like to go to three days of the training under this topic. Well, unless I asked, you know, I wasn't going to get it. So maybe the training is the reward. The planning, and you can see uh, all of these type things are um, typical for an organization. The compensation system, y'all talked about that, good or bad. The information system, your technology, your budgeting system, communication. And then the processes, which, I mean, we were always big on separating the people from the problems. I mean, we, we took the attitude that we hire good people. So we've got these problems, but it's we've got good people because we hire good people. And if we hire good people and retrain good people, you know, our assets are, are our people, and we just took a mindset of separating that from the problem. Okay. So, like, not putting all the problems on an individual's back, right. sort of accepting it as this is the company's problem. We have faith in our people. Let's figure it out. Right. Taking that attitude first, right, the, the easy thing to do is go, well, Clovis, go out there and fix the, you know, because I got this phone call. I had not, I'll be honest, I, I, I was angry. And so I had not separated the stimuli from the response thing. It was a, you know, I was thinking Clovis is the problem. Um, I think that was a good question. One of you asked the questions about <coughs> how do you blame somebody? And, I, and I, I kind of remember the student answer that question. Who do you blame somebody? And typically, you don't want to blame somebody. Number one, if you're, if you're the supervisor, you should first take a look at yourself. Like, Dale, you know, good example. Yeah. Like, Gosh, I shouldn't have said that. That was a problem. But also, a lot of people just blame they'll blame them. So why, again, you have to look for the ability to kind of operate in a different perspective the best you can. So yeah. Other than blaming somebody. Focus on interest, not positions. And be on options for mutual gain. Insist on objective criteria. Um, I don't have any good examples that I can think of right offhand on, on processes. Uh, but you... If you watch Enron, <laughs> the documentary, I mean, their business processes and a lot of this, it was, it was created to, uh, to achieve profit, but it, I, I think it was an unintended consequence, honestly, that the unintended consequence was their systems and their processes actually created a culture which was toxic and it eventually created lies and just everything negative you could think of that would bring a business down. And it did. Big crash. And it's a great, great story. And I'm sure it'll be repeated again in history sometime when people get greedy. But uh, it's a good, good lesson learned. And the point of this is that the systems have to support the win-win um, and use principle negotiation, not positional. By positional, that is, you know, because you've been given the, the power, the authority because that came with that position. One of the, uh, back to integrity and, and this sort of thing is, um, it's so easy to, to get in a, a group and start talking about an individual who's not present. And the, the courage and character ethic is to avoid that. 
And as a leader, when people see that, you know, he never slams somebody, or you see a leader that does, well, you know, you can distinguish between those two pretty easily. So, I, I, that's back to this positional thing here. <coughs> okay, Dick, I've left you a little bit more time than 10 minutes, but let me, before you come up, um, any questions on this? And then, I mean, I went back and picked up some things that I hopefully clarified or reinforced that I thought was pre- the biggest aha to summarize is when you move from being a manager, remember? A manager manages things, budgets, schedules, uh, systems, uh, processes, those types of things. A leader is all about taking care of their people and getting more out of their people by be, by serving their people. Having that that true understanding that the people are who produce the work, and so you take care of your people. You get to know your people. You build relationships. The relationships are based on trust. You have their best interest before your own. If you make them better, the team gets better. It produces more, and it's a it's like being an orchestra leader. You start all of a sudden, man, everything's in harmony, and it's just like. You're not playing the instruments. You're not playing one of them. But everybody's out there play, doing their thing, and you're just up here, and, and it's a beautiful thing when that happens. And everybody's having a good time. So, so you move in. Yeah, next week when I come back, we're going to cover habit five, six, 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 six and seven. And Probably, I, I wanted to do five, we're going to spend a lot of time in that, and I appreciate it if y'all would really think about that, but um, seeking first to understand, then to be understood, is probably the, the uh, most important habit. The most important habit. And you don't learn it, it's not taught. Uh, you, you learn public speaking. You learn how to debate. You learn all of these type of things. You can take classes and everything, but you're not learned or taught how to listen. And that's probably the biggest thing of a leader is listening empathically to understand rather than to listen to impose your will or, you know, whatever. So... We're going to spend time next week in that. A lot, a lot of good, a lot of good stories for you guys. <laughs> you, you don't have to. Don't run away. Oh. Well, I'm not because you're. You can help me answer some of these oh. questions that these guys raise. These are tough questions. I'm not going to be. Res- I'm going to be responsible. Right? Are you scared? <laughs> scared? Are you scared? Is that a, is that a Texas scared? Yeah, I mean, my son gave me a bumper sticker, and when he was in high school, I, I had a company car. And he and his buddies thought it would be real funny. They found this bumper sticker somewhere. And they put it on my company car. And it became my, and it said, ain't scared. Ain't scared. <laughs> ain't scared. <laughs> I'm scared. So That's a text. Yeah. I can tell. Okay, what are the questions? Okay, a couple of questions, guys. Thanks. And we'll talk about uh, <laughs> mostly the win-win. Again, you guys have some great questions here, but... Um, let me ask you Julie. Uh, Julie, help me, help me understand the software issue about the win Win lose, win win, with software. I, I couldn't quite figure out. So maybe maybe no one else got confused. Um, I'm actually open to the page. Um, so the guy had a contract um, for eighty four thousand dollars. The leader of the company changed. Um, the new the new leader didn't want to go through with the contract, and so the guy let him walk away. And he says, "I felt in the long run, if the principle were true, it would come back and pay dividends." So he was hoping that it would be a win win, but technically it was a win lose, wasn't it? Because he lost eighty four thousand dollars in contract money, hoping that it would come back to him. 
Okay, so he thought, okay, the contractor then felt like uh, he was trying to walk away from the contract? Or was this? Sorry. Um, he, he allowed his client to walk away from the contract. Oh. <laughs> the client wanted something different. Are you reading it? Uh-huh, I have it. The client wanted something different than the original contract, right? They said the software wasn't going to work for them or something? Yeah, they just weren't happy about it. They thought yeah. they might want to go with someone else. Yeah. So instead of enforcing the contract, he said, okay, I won't do business. Maybe I'll see you some other time. And they came back, I think. Yeah. That's not a win-win. That's a, that's a <laughs> no. win-lose, hopefully win-win. <laughs> that's a win, maybe. Maybe win. Well, <laughs> it sounds like, I'm, I'm just trying to put this together, but... Um, It sounds like it became it was a win win maybe at one time but then it became a no deal. Well then um, the the original person that he had the contract with came back later and wanted to find a different contract for two hundred and forty thousand dollars. So he ended up still having a contract with the company and ended up being more money, but I mean is that coincidence or is that it actually coming to fruition in the win win thing being true? Do any good deeds go unpunished? Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't think understand it enough. Well. I mean, just listening to it, it sounds like it's a it's a no deal. Did the guy walk away from it? He did. Okay. Okay. So, so can I can I just give my yeah, please. <laughs> so it was a bank, and there was a guy that was originally in charge of the bank, and he signed a deal with this man that sold software, and um, all of the bank's employees were unhappy about it. They didn't like the software. They didn't want to learn how to use the new software. Meanwhile, while the transition was going on to this new software, a new bank manager came into the picture, and he went to the software salesman and said, everybody at my branch is unhappy with this. I don't want the contract anymore. I don't want the software anymore. So the, the software salesman just decided out of the blue, okay, fine, I'm not going to enforce this $84,000 contract, and he ripped the contract up. So to me, that was, I, I, I totally agree with Julie, that in, the, in that situation, it seemed like a lose-win to the software salesman. He lost an $84,000 contract with no guarantee that the big new bank manager was going to come back a month later and say, okay, I've had time to let the dust settle. I actually do want to buy some software from you. Well, how did they know they didn't like the software if they hadn't bought it from him and he installed it? Oh, they, they bought it for the 84000 That's what she's saying. He ripped up the contract for the 84000 when this guy came back and said, I don't actually want this. Nobody's happy. The contract okay. was signed. Okay, yeah. so, so they signed a con they had an agreement, they signed a contract, mm -hmm. he performed the contract. I'm assuming as he performed the contract, he sent his bills in, he got paid for his work, which had a contract amount of eighty four thousand. At the end of all of that, he had his eighty four thousand, but the owner had a software that he didn't like. Mm -hmm. No, they didn't even get to that point. They started implementing the software. He hadn't got paid for it. It was a potential $84,000 he hadn't even been paid for, and he ripped up the contract and said, you guys seem really unhappy about this transition. I won't make you pay me for this software. We won't do the full implementation. He walked away from the contract. So they both walked away. Okay, that's a no deal. Yeah, he, he may have determined that I can never satisfy these people. Right. And so rather than you being dissatisfied, I'm willing to walk away, no deal. If you're willing to have no deal with me and the guy says, we're in agreement. Are we in agreement that we're not going to have a deal? And goes, we are. Okay, have a nice day. <laughs> you made it sound like they had a contract. That yeah, it sounds like it was signed and they had paid a deposit. Um, the contract had been signed. They secured the products and they didn't want to follow through. I think so he ripped. He ripped up a contract, which I don't. I've never heard of that happening. But basically, I think he was tempted. Like, there's a temptation there that you could have a win-lose situation where, like, I'm going to force you to follow through with the contract. Right. 
even though it hurts you, just because it helps me. But he chose to go with the no deal, yeah. which is the more ethical. Right. It's a difficult decision, right. but it's, it's obviously the right thing to do, right? Yeah. Um, so I guess the question is, how do you deal with, how do you, I guess, integrity thing? How do you always choose no deal over when it's tough. It's tempting, it's a tough right? decision, it's a, but number one, at least you're saying it, you saw what happened, so you know what the implications are, as opposed to not doing the no deal. I mean, he could have gotten in there and tried to make that client happy and spent the next three years of his life and not only ruined his personal life, ruined his company, and still... <laughs> Nobody's happy. Nobody's happy. That'd been, that'd been terrible. So maybe he saw real quick that we just need to tear this up and... <laughs> Here's a you know guy that you might call that could help you. It's the same idea if you sell something, not even in engineering, do you let them return it? Or are you one of those companies that's just tricked, like, all receipts are final. No, right, you know, right. like, that's not the right. Right. Okay. It's very good. <laughs> right. That is a tough question. Yeah. Sorry. Took I think a it's a long deal. deal. Good question. No, 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 no. It took a little while, but now we got it. Okay. How do you come up with a win-win solution if the party is resistant, even the facts, and it doesn't want to deal with it? Facts and information. How do you get a win-win? You're trying to implement a win-win with somebody who doesn't care, essentially. How do you do that? That was my question, and it was sort of in context of policy, which may be a completely different story in the business, but because it's like, oh, yeah, but the principle is true. How do you, if you don't agree on the basic, you know, uh, facts or tenets of what you're trying to do, how do, you, how do you overcome that, I guess, is probably where I was getting, what I was getting at. Hmm. So you can't even get to an agreement? Um, it's almost, if I were to use the uh, picture analogy with the old lady versus the young woman. Uh, you know, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's almost like they don't agree on looking, seeing at that picture. Like, they don't agree that, so they don't, you know, I guess that story is relevant because no. they go back and forth and they try and illuminate each other's perspectives or whatever. But sometimes, at least when I was thinking of politics, it's like sometimes they won't even agree on what the problem is. It's oh, like, yeah. How do you get beyond that? It's that's kind of a tough one, problem. maybe. But um, I mean, if, if somebody who's, you know, if you have a desire to win win and nobody's going to agree with, with the win version, uh, if I had abided by that at Black and Beach, I think Black and Beach would have gone out of business. So from time to time, you know, you try to avoid them. You don't want to, it's, again, it's difficult. You have to define win. <laughs> you know, we're happy with the, with the win, and we got just enough budget to do it, which is maybe that's not a win-win kind of deal. But still, you know, you've got, again, it defines on your, your win. Now, if you've, You've got the contract, when you're losing money, that's a win-lose. Don't go down that road. So you can't, again, you're never going to convince anybody to be a, a completely win-win, so we're all happy and we just split, split the difference. I guess you get, this would turn into a no-deal potentially, I guess. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah. Yeah, it yeah, like yeah, it. yeah, you have to decide. Sometimes. But then again, you know, you look at what's driving your business at that particular time, and maybe you're just trying to keep your resources actively engaged in work and you're willing to uh, not make your typical profit margin, you know, or just the opposite, if you've got a lot of work and you're tying up your valuable resources in this, this, you know, bath, it's going to frustrate your staff. I mean, it's just a no, no win situation and you no deal it. Or maybe it's a job where you're using an innovative technology and it's the first of its use and you want the you want the uh, the marketing and the and the the wow factor, you know, to, for your brand or something. I, I don't know, but uh, I think you have to look at it from a bunch of different perspectives. But at the same time, to finish that, is sit down with your staff, the people that will be doing the work, and explain, we've got new goals here, you know, and adjust everybody's goals so everybody's working for the same. Uh, same goal. Maybe it's not a few, the, the typical profit. Maybe it's a, a different goal. And again, you have to have a different definition of win on the other side. Because again, if it's always, yeah, you, if you walk away, very so, again, I know a few contracts Black and Beach walked away from a few. 
but for my 30 years. Typically, you're willing to <clears throat> accept something that's not quite a win, and you hope to work it into a win-win. I don't know, what, Julie, maybe that's what happened with a contractor. He figured out he could work it as a win-win. And, so, and most of the time, it turns out okay. I mean, you can, you know, I'm speaking in terms of my experience, but I don't know. Well, I, I, I've walked. I mean, you, you, you just get a sense sometimes. I mean, if right. it's a big exactly. one, if it, it, but you sometimes you get a exactly. Oh yeah, you can just feel it. And the best time, the best time <laughs> to work. walk is at the beginning. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, it's not like well, we hope, maybe, and then you get into it, and all of a sudden you're like, why did we ever take that That's, job? It, I knew it at the beginning that this thing. That's why you talk about an agreement at the very beginning. That's the first step. And that usually comes after you've had a bad experience. You learn, well, I'll never do that again. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, no, great point. Um, again, another question. Win-win um, can only survive in an organization when the system support it. How can one prevent this change if the systems don't already exist to support win-win? So in other words, you've got you got a company you're trying to move into the win-win thing, but yet <coughs> quite, the company hasn't quite gotten there. Yet. We want them to lose. Or, <clears throat> you know, how do you move into the win-win from the win lose or lose win, depending on what? Because you have these two things that aren't there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, essentially they don't exist. Or they exist, but they're they're, they're people don't understand win-win. They don't care. You know, don't know it or they don't. You know, I don't know, I guess it depends upon your your influence. I mean if you're if you're a you have to start looking at how you can influence change. I mean that's a very I mean first of all it's like is this a battle that I want to fight? You know, I, I feel so strongly in, in change of this. Right. But, is this something that I want to take on? And if the answer to that is yes, then it becomes a, a, a project in itself as to how do I quietly go about causing change while not disrupting the organization. It's almost like, and, and John had asked a, a similar question to that, and this is, you know, how do you recommend changing an organization uh, from a win-lose to a win-win? Same, same question. John is saying it. And basically, that's it. I think it's very difficult to go in and you know, so company, we're going to change this. Number one, if you're, you know, if you're a project manager or um, you have the ability to deal with a client, then you try to, okay, let's work out a win-win deal with this client. Because then you can demonstrate that to other people in the company. This guy, you got to be thinking win-win as best you can. Um, and again, when you get into the win-win mindset, Trust me, you know, I went through a deal with engineering management trying to figure out, I want to offer engineering management, I want them to offer more of these classes other than the three courses here so that they could expand and they can get more water young professionals who don't want to come back to Boulder and they don't have an engineering background, they want to get a master's degree. So I'm trying to figure, okay, what's the win-win? Now for me, I want to have more students so I get more revenue or I have more people, more students in my class. They want to make sure, I want to make sure them understand, number one, they're going to get more students to get a, an, an ME degree from engineering management. So again, you always, no matter what you do, you think about what's the win-win thing that I can sit down and talk to the other party so that they can have a better understanding of it. Because if you show up and this is why a good thing for me, you don't work. Not going to work. So again, well, it, how to convey it. Uh, don't know the specifics there, but I remember talking to my wife, she's a high school counselor, and here again, that's government, nonprofits, public schools, and um, she was frustrated having a situation. And I was asking her, I said, well, why do y'all exist? And, and we were, I was just asking questions. I mean, and she was so into it, she, what do you mean? You know, what? why does the school exist? Well, to teach this, to, you know, so all of a sudden I started 
focusing in on who's the customer. And it's the students. I mean, if, if there were no students, the school would close, right? <clears throat> so is this good for the students? How does it benefit the students? You know, it's the students, the students, the students, and everything. And all of a sudden, I could tell she was like, oh. <laughs> and she put her little pitch together and everything and went and sold it to benefit the students. And people were like, yeah, yeah, you know. Again, it can be a yeah, it can be a win 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 deal. Win 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 deals where it's you know that it's, it's we've simplified it. It can get complicated, you know. But again, always be looking for somebody other can get a win out of your deal. Uh, okay, one one last question, uh, Ahmad, and again, this is a good one. How do I see? And maybe we've heard the similar question in the past, but. How can I escape a case of lose-win in a workplace when I'm taken advantage of and given, uh, I'm given more work than my coworkers without any extra credit? Maybe we've talked about this a little bit, guys. I, I don't know. But how do you get out of a, a workplace in a win-lose? Um, number one, you can always, you don't have to, you know, you're not married to a company, no matter what you are. And, uh, Again, these days, it's not a problem with leaving a company as long as you leave them professionally. No matter how much you think it's a win-lose deal at that point in time, maybe you need to be you know, looking about that. But again, you have to be very professional about it. Um, you don't threaten, don't ever walk in to your employer and say, either give me a raise or I'm going to quit. Well, he won't give you the opportunity to quit. He'll fire you. <laughs> so don't. You have to be very careful about these sort of things. Again, so you have to be very professional. That's why, I don't know. How do you, how do you solve the win news in the world? Well, I mean, again, pick your battle. Mm -hmm. But to put yourself in the best position, you would be um, a well-respected, highly acknowledged asset to the organization. Uh, I mean, otherwise they would, you know, you're just a cog. At, we'll take that one out. And there's another one out in the lobby right there. We'll just plug in. So I, I don't know. You have to look at kind of what's your, again, your influence, you know. Um, and if it's a situation, then maybe you, yeah, it's not the right place for you to be at that time. I, never, I, you know. I'm wondering if, um, if he or she's, you know, brought this up and vocalized it, you know, because you can sit there all day and feel wronged. Oh, yeah. Your superiors may not realize that or something. You know, you may have to speak up as the first step. At least. Yeah. I always you have to speak up a little bit, but you have to choose again. Yeah, you have to choose the right battle. And how. I, somebody, I don't know if it was Megan or... Yeah, um, just that's a different perspective. I, I ran into that feeling a little bit um, at different times throughout the first three years working where I work. And I sort of had to make the decision one day, I feel like, that I wasn't going to feel like I was being given more work. I wasn't going to compare the amount of work I was getting to my coworkers because the reason I was getting more work was because I was doing a good job, and the reason I do a good job is because it's fulfilling to me to be ambitious, to be to have good work ethic, to be on top of my work, to be a reliable person for my boss or my boss's boss to come to with something that they need done. So for me, I just had to stop comparing how much work I was getting to other people because clearly it just you know it it, it wasn't something that fulfilled them to to work as hard as I was working, but it is something that fills me. So I, I sort of just had to take that perspective and that, that helped me in feeling like I wasn't um, wasn't being wronged. So I, I don't feel like I'm losing. I feel like I'm winning and that those other people are actually the ones that are losing. You, you said something that <clears throat> based on my experience that I generally came up with this, I, maybe somebody else came up before me, but I called it the three deadly seeds. And these were generally generally true, is when you start competing with a coworker, like what you said. Maybe it's not overt competition, but inside, you're, 
you're competing. Then that runs into comparing. Now you start quantifying things to compare. And then the third deadly C after you've done that is usually complaining. And if you can avoid that, and it's not always easy to do, it, it seems like things are better than if you really dig into it, you know. So well, it, that's a good point. I think, again, that's a very good point. If you can see moving down the three C's road, that's time you, you need to look out or look for something else. There's no doubt about that. I, at Black and Beach, I've been there 15 years. Uh, a lot of people were making partners at that point in time. And I thought, how do these guys, these guys, you know, yeah. I had very little respect for people recovering. Now they're good guys, people. Yeah, they're good guys because they're all men at that stage. Um, and it's like, and again, you reach a certain point where you have to either I'm going to stay or I'm going to move on. Rather, don't stay and complain. Don't do, you know, don't do that other stuff. Um, again, again, the first partner that I worked for at Black and Beach was Dwight Sales. Good guy. He was in World War II as a Marine in World War II. And again, Dwight had a much different perspective on how to manage people than, than anybody else that I've ever run into. And again, I'll, I'll tell you one thing a guy that worked for Dwight has said, and again, when you start complaining about something, um, he just said, you, you know, if you're going to pull out a weapon and you're just going to scare somebody, don't do that. Because, again, yeah, you're going to threaten to do this or that. Don't go down that road. You know, if you're not going to use the weapon, don't pull it out unless you're going to use it. So the point here is that don't go down the complaining road without your men to move on. That's just a certain level that you read. And Dwight was a great guy. You know, amazing guy. Much different personality from the Marine World War II. Great guy. So, the language out of his office was pretty <laughs> amazing. <laughs> you could hear it all over the office. So. Wow. Different, different era. Anything else, guys? Any questions? Again, thanks for your I, questions. Oh, go ahead. Um, um, this kind of something that I'm thinking about is that you know, we keep talking about leaders and managers and qualities of good leaders, and I think a lot of people, maybe half the class is either still in school, um, undergrad, or like me, kind of entry level still. Um, so everyone at some point is going to have good managers and bad managers. I think Absolutely. that's just how it is. Um, so as a young person who doesn't have a lot of influence and um, when you do come across maybe a manager who you don't click very well with and um, kind of recognize that some of these leadership qualities aren't there but you know maybe you don't want to move on and um, what are some like tips for either mindset or actions or how to kind of get through with one person as opposed to the organization not being right, just one person. <laughs> well, I'm sure we have yeah, both been through this first. Go ahead. You go first. And oh, I'm still thinking. I'm like, um, well, I go back to something my grandmother always told me. She said, stick to your own knitting. I was like, what? <laughs> you know, and so it was more of just focusing on what you can control, and that's yourself, your attitude, uh, your quality of your work. Um, you know, am I an asset? Am I growing or whatever? And maybe that's just me, Inc., you know, me incorporated that you've got to take into as a mindset during that period because nothing like that lasts forever. It may seem like it's going to last forever, but it's a period that maybe you can um, develop, you know, some skills that, that you're waiting for your time. You're, you're just kind of biding your time and you're sticking to to yourself and try to look and, and grow from this experience. I mean, all of my growth rings, if I look back like a tree and I see these growth rings, each one of them I can point to, and it was during a tough time that I felt like giving up or I whatever. It was during the hard times that I had to persevere or that's when I grew uh, just out of, out of, um, 
what's the word? I guess perseverance. It's like, I'm not giving up on this, you know. So I would either buy a book or uh, go to a class outside of work or, you know, whatever uh, that I needed, thought I might need to do to, to uh, get through this. Okay. I think, number one, yeah, when it's tough, when you have a tough manager, you're not a floor man, no matter what you are. Because <laughs> a lot of people cannot treat you like a floor man. You know, that's how it is. There are some people that will do that. Um, you know, when I, when I worked at Black and Beach or in the Army or, you know, you know, wherever I was working, there were certain people that, man, I had put up with them for a certain period of time, and then you reach a point. I've got to look some other... Uh, opportunity inside the company, and if it's a small company, that's pretty tough. But you got to figure out: Are there other people that I could work with instead of this specific person? Because I worked with per, with some people that I had very little respect for, frankly, because I know what they're doing, I know what they're trying to do. Now they weren't illegal or immoral. You know, yeah, nothing illegal, that's for sure. But there are things that they were doing that were just like, I can't. What is this guy doing that stuff? So you always try to avoid getting stuck with those people. And if you do, you got to look for another opportunity. When you have a big corporation, you can do that. That's much easier. Small company, it's very difficult. So, and don't feel bad. Don't feel bad if it's a manager who's not that good. Um, again, you don't want to quit immediately, as, as I think as Dale said. It takes some time. It takes some time. But at a point, time you're going to reach a point like, i got to look for a different direction. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying you quit. You look for a different department, you look for another different opportunity that's a little closer to you. And again, that will happen. I've had graduate students that have been out three or five years come back and talk about, I work for this person, but you know, it took a little time, but I could figure out there's something else I could do in this company, a consulting firm. So that's really that's a thing. So it'll happen to all of you. There's no doubt. It'll happen to all of you. Don't feel like you're all alone. Anything else? Just one last comment on that. Um, sure. if, if it's not as extreme as feeling like you can't somehow figure out um, a different way, I think this is actually like the perfect example of creating a win-win situation. The, the su supervisor that I had previous to the one I have now was unbelievable. He was my mentor from the start of my career and he was just a, a really great supervisor. And then I got promoted and my new supervisor and I just had completely different work styles and or have completely different work styles. And then he also just, he didn't know me at all before I started working for him. So he had no concept of what my abilities were. Um, so I felt almost like in being promoted, I had actually been demoted because I was working for someone who had no idea what I was capable of, and I didn't feel like I I was being given the work that I was capable of. So for me, that was the, this was the first situation where I feel like in work I really had to try to create a win-win, and I was very frustrated. I went back to my mentor and said, "I don't know if this was the right move. Like it's yeah, it's more pay, but I I don't I'm not happy." And he said, well, what do you, what, what can you do? I'm like, well, I, I don't know. I've looked at other openings. He's like, no, no. What can you do to make him understand that you're a good worker and you know what you're doing? And he said, you need to just figure out how to, how to cater to his work style for a while until you've proven that you can do good work. And he'll, he'll you know, open up the reins a little bit. And that's exactly what happened. I just had to go out of my way to keep him in the loop on everything that I did and for a while. And then eventually it was, okay, okay, I, I trust that you can do good work and I'm going to back off a little bit. So. Well, yeah, great mentor. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. And that's the key thing. Everyone's, you, know, you don't want to get mad and just walk out the door immediately. Sometimes you have to change, not your personality, sometimes you have to change how you work with somebody else, which is fine. I mean... From time to time, you have to change production modes, how you do that. Uh, but again, that, I think that was very good. But it got, ultimately, sometimes you reach one like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> I can't sleep anymore at night and things like that. So, yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, guys. Um, we'll see you next Wednesday.
Award number two is due, and don't forget your questions. Thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah, I know that um, 